Thank you very much for having me here. I hope you can cope with my English. I'm not a native speaker, as you suggest. I'm from Germany and hope uh, everybody will understand what I have to say today. Otherwise, Martin will help out to translate this or that into Danish. Um, as uh, <coughs> we go, I will present you and guide you through the um, methodology of the biodigester. The biodigester is not a product. The biodigester is a methodology. And for that reason, the only thing what we can do as a company, um, which is very small, we can spread out the word of the methodology of the biodigester, and we have no product to sell. And just to uh, take it in the right perspective, it's nothing what happened uh, to us. It was not taken into writing by our company. It was done 40 years ago by a Frenchman called John Payne. <coughs> Where to put it here, right? Okay. Yeah, this Frenchman, uh, John Pain, put in writing what other people maybe experienced that time. Unfortunately, he was 40 years ahead of the time, and nobody was really interested in it because at that day, oil for the he central heating cost eight cent, and uh, whatever they put in place and how he showed it will work within our environment was far too early. Since 30 years within our network, we experienced the biomiler or the digesting system of compost with heat ourselves, but putting it into a company only took place three years ago when the heating cost almost came up by one cubic meter of gas or by one liter of oil to one euro. And that was the first time that people listened to this methodology because muscle power and our nature and our environment could help out to harvest heat from the composting of uh, wooden um, material. And we are not talking about the wood which you can use for panels and for furniture. We are talking about the leaves. We are talking about the branches up to the diameter of 10 centimeter. What this biological process needs is the skin of the wood and all the smaller ingredients which cannot be burned or cannot be fabricated into any kind of valuables. The very important thing to this methodology is that we have two very, very important things to us, which is 50% soil building humus and compost which is equally ex, uh, important to our company and our, to our methodology and thinking as 50% valuable of heat. So harvesting heat, we get humus and compost, or harvesting compost and humus, we get heat. So people getting into this methodology to harvest heat for the house, for farming, for um, uh, feed breeding and, and all this kind of things, the same time get so much humus that they can't get rid of it without putting it into the soil. So one of our guys, when we get started, said, oh my God, you put it into a company and you're going public with this and this is then that the people don't think about our soil, that they don't think about mother nature, they only think about heat. And I said, don't worry, if they have uh, 60 or 80 cubic meters of uh, humus after the time they use the heat, they don't know how to use it. So latest, the third year after they uh, got into the heat uh, harvesting, they have such a good result on their nature products around them that they can't avoid to talk about what the soil and the humus and compost did to them. And uh, by going into this, we came out that we have really a 360 degree view to this kind of methodology. So getting into it, you also have to rethink within your political smaller environment. In Germany, we have a situation that all the green cut collected from the small landowner and from the farming at a particular regional place is not owned by the community anymore because they have a contract, a long-lasting contract, with one of the uh, recycling companies. 
the moment I want to take it from this place, someone is in front of me and says, stop. It's not owned by you, it's not owned by the community, it's owned by our recycling company and we uh, sell it to the um, bigger um, uh, Kraftwerke, to the bigger um, grid companies to produce heat in a, a mass uh, amount. So starting with the biomiler also starts to change environmental thinking within your next community. So that uh, the mayor has to make sure what is ever harvested on green cut should be available to someone who wants to build a biomiler. The uh, next important thing is that we have within our economy our muscle power turned into energy, which is normally not possible. So if you think that you want to put muscle power into gas or into oil, you never will be successful, you can't do that. But with this methodology, uh, you harvest heat without any burning chamber, with any technology, and it's a real low cost product. The big advantage is also that you <coughs> can use it decentralized. At a compound like this, you would have many places where you could put up a biomiler uh, to harvest heat for uh, showering or for central heating or for any other use uh, within the animal feeding environment where you need heat. So the Hollandish people found out that cows feed it with warm water give three to five percent more milk. So that is uh, to them quite a bit of advantage uh, to feed their uh, cows with warm water rather than with the cold water from the grid or from the ground. Um, the autonomy on this is the independence from any kind of local um, system which provides you with energy to get heat out of uh, at the bottom line. If you are only looking into the material itself, we are talking about the green cut and as I said, we don't want to use the wood which can be um, used for any other kind of things for heating purposes. It normally is about 15 centimeter in diameter and all the smaller cuts, that is what we want to have in our biomiler. The wood chips, the energy, the compost we harvest and um, the methodology to put it into our soil and to get a very uh, long-lasting vegetables and fruits out of it uh, led um, John Payne to the book which is called Another Kind of Garden. This book is available in the internet or you can ask me, send me an email, I will send you the English or the German version of it. And 50% of the book and with the beginning started with the other kind of garden and in a moment I will show you why he announced it another kind of garden. Um, the biomiler itself has the components of water, of wood chips, of some pipes and a pump. The only mechanical part on electricity, electricity on this biomiler is a pump. <coughs> Nothing else is needed. So there's a very, very simple, inexpensive form to get up this kind of uh, <coughs> energy harv harvesting system. The second big advantage is that if you're a little bit more um, in experiences and uh, into DIY, as a self-helping workshop thing, you might be able to harvest also methane gas. So if you put a tank inside of the bio uh, miler of the uh, of the compost heap, you have the ideal um, temperature to harvest methane gas. So biogas uh, component is also related to this methodology. Um, we have three of the biomiler which we built in the past three years with such a kind of tank, but the amount of gas you harvest is not really that much and uh, it is expected to use it on daily basis. So on a daily basis, you might be able to run a little generator with 600 watt or one kilowatt about three to four hours. So it's not, not a big deal, but it helps to be pretty much independent. It will not help a little um, business, but it will help the household and whatever kind of energy you need for your computer, for your television and for your mobile phone.
Jamen, altså det han siger, det er den øh, øh, metode, der er sådan to principper i. Den ene er at, at vinde varmen derfra, fra kompostgyngen, og, og så er der en, en yderligere udvikling, øh, hvor man kan placere en, en, en lille biogasreaktor inde midt i, i øh, øh, bioreaktoren, altså den, fordi der er en optimal temperatur derinde, og så på den måde kan man øh, forgere gassen, øh, forgere øh, organisk materiale. Ja, man trækker gassen ud, ja. ja. Altså man har en beholder, som man fylder med, med noget substrat, som man så forgerer. Så sætter en beholder ind midt i, 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 i dyngen. Ja, altså man placerer en, en, en beholder i altså en, en biogasreaktor. Uh, en, 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 simpelthen en beholder, som man fylder med noget husholdningsaffald og andre ting, og så, bygge, så fylder man op med kompostflis eller med, med træflis og, og bygger sin bioreaktor i øvrigt øh, op omkring den. Og så har man en optimal temperatur derinde, som så varmer øh, den der biogasreaktor inde midt i, den varmer den så op, og så på den måde kan man producere både gas, biogas, metan og, øh, og varme. Så gassen fra den yderste kompost, den øh, lader man forsvinde? Altså nej, den gas, der, der, der måtte opstå der, den indgår i komposteringsprocessen. Ja, yeah, this is uh, a separate tank inside. So we only use a, a temperature to make gas within the tank. There is no gas related to the biocomposting, uh, biological chemical process. So the process you see outside here, we brought one of the small biodigesters, or the big one, has no methane gas at all. It is an aerobic, anaerobic biochemical process without methane gas to the environment. So it's totally environmentally safe. <laughs> so we have two methodologies to build up a compost heap. The classic methodology from John Payne was only to use fresh cut and shredded wood, which shouldn't be older than 10 days. So whenever you cut your environmental um, forest um, uh, processing and you have the green cut and you are able to wood chip it with a chipper into small pieces, you should use it within 10 days. The reason is that the bacteria between the wooden part and the skin Uh, evaporate and disappear when they don't have the right environment. So it needs moisture full with a lot of water and it needs to be fresh to generate heat. If you have older components of woodcuts or saw dust from the sawmill or any kind of uh, dinkel, um, schrot, how is that called? This, um, uh, so if you have this kind of material, you do need um, dunk and uh, slurry from horses manure, from chicken, from cow. Pig manure is a little bit colder, it's almost 5 to 10 degrees colder than the other manure. But if you mix that so that you have at least 40% of the wooden part and minimum 30% of the manure, then you will have the right mixture to get also old material started. And the wonderful thing is, even if you have old construction wood, which uh, with, with a lot of um, xylamone and all these kind of chemicals, present preservatives, it totally disappears after the period of composting. So the composting procedure has a biological uh, chemical process to get rid of any kind of seeds from the um, tomatoes from the pumpkins, there are no E. coli ba bacteria left, there are no botulismin uh, bacteria left, so there's a total biochemical process of hygienization from all the things we don't want to have in our soil after composting. How about seaweed? Can you use that? Seaweed you can use, yes. But um, what we have to avoid is that we have a fouling process into it, what would, is it, I, I, yeah, um, the, the, it is a rotting process, but it shouldn't be uh, foilness, um, what is it in English? 
or what is it in Danish? In Danish, we say it's Rollenentzündung. Yeah, so we have to avoid this because this is giving us a Botulismum bacteria, which we totally don't want to have. But the process itself never would go into the foilness uh, environment um, since the bacteria and the enzymes are responsible for, for the biochemical process uh, doing it by themselves. So the knowledge of this bacteria and enzymes are very, very powerful. Could you say that the poisonous uh, wood preservatives would disappear? Disappear totally, yeah. Yeah, the biochemical process put everything in uh, the molecules into atoms and the atoms are then reusable and without any kind of uh, poisoning structure. Um, oh, okay, so, um, I was in the process to explain the two different methodologies. The methodology on water and wood chips from Jean Pain and the methodology on um, manure wood chips and water or slurry from uh, horse and cow manure. Um, this is a process which I recently came across uh, and totally explained by the uh, German guy Walter Witte. So he did a um, uh, <coughs> science thing about this the past 19 years, which now is with the university the past five years. And next year, 2014, we expect to have the doctor, the PhD um, work from one guy from the university ready to explain the entire process on the biochemical basis. In the moment, we only have the explanation by uh, results. Um, the two methodologies, if you go with manure or if you only go with uh, wood and water, has in common that they are totally low cost no costs involved, right? Just a few pipes. The meter of the pipe is about 60 to 70 cent, uh, euro cent, which is very, very little in, in investing. And then you have a pump, which is roughly 120 euros. And um, all the other things around it is something for the eye, for the environmentally um, uh, uh, feeling. So if you would like to put around some coverage by wood plates or something like this, it's up to you. For the process itself, it's not necessary. The second big advantage is if you want to go into the compost hardening methodologies and you look into the school books these days or in the uh, science these days, it's always called the Arabic um, composting. And the Arabic composting at least needs machinery roughly around 20,000 euros and a two weeks engagement or two times engagement every week to turn around the compost heap. And this methodology is based on put it up and leave it alone. It will work itself and it will give you much, much better results than you ever do the uh, aerobic composting by turning around the compost heap. So that's uh, also another big advantage. And um, as I know, in Germany especially, only two or three percent of the farming environmental people are in composting. All the rest saying, if I put the shit on the field, it will digest itself. That was maybe true a hundred years from now or earlier, because at that time the soil was pretty well in his uh, structure. These days, after 70, 80 years of uh, chemical um, fertilization, there is no structure in the soil. So the soil components and the soil results uh, done from the laboratories are very, very much to be compared with the desert in the Sahel zone. So our uh, soils in Germany in many, many places is as bad as the dust and as the desert um, in any other place. So the last year we had a very big <coughs> erosion uh, problem uh, by wind when uh, hundreds of cubic meters flown through the air and we had big car accidents in Germany related to this uh, event of erosion. Um, I'm not really going into the biochemical process. I think Martin will take care of it uh, in the second half of this um, meeting. I just want to um, make sure that uh, I get into this sentence from Mr. Witte, who did this um, science uh, 
observation over the past 20 years, he's saying in this process with the micro, uh, biological, um, uh, biochemical process, which Martin will leverage a little bit later on, is that it totally lost its former structure. So whatever you put in there, it's totally lost. It's a homogene, independent, and um, uh, atomic structure. So this uh, humus material um, has so many components which are plant available that you can't even in a laboratory see the molecules. You only find the atoms. You don't find anything. If you would give that to a laboratory, they would say, what is this? There, there's nothing. But in the moment, the roots of the plant send out their enzymes and asking for water, H2O, it is built out of this humus structure. So in this humus structure, you have H and you have O. And as many as a plant want at this time, it is thirsty, it would build from H and O, H2O. And so it happens with all the other materials, with the minerals and whatever is within this um, compost you get out of this. The humus is also able to ascend in any direction. So it's going left and right. So what he did, he put up um, uh, glass pipes two meter high and put normal soil on top, he put some compost on top, and he put the micro uh, carbonization compost on top, and he watered it every day with two, 20 milliliters of water so that the water could run through these uh, glass pipes. And after a few days, it was very easy to see that from the um, carbonization compost, the uh, black material went down to, one, the, to the depth of one meter and 20, and then it stopped. So he was thinking, my God, why is it not going deeper? Obviously, the bacteria and enzymes exactly know which is the uh, most valuable depth uh, to feed the plants in the normal environment. So with all the other two pipes or three pipes he set up, he had no result like this. So that was very, very amazing to him that he could see how these microbiological compost uh, would um, travel through the soil environment. So. Um, and the uh, result is that the humus outcome from this methodology is fully plant available, which a lot of other components uh, for virtualization is not, or only a short moment, and then it's going to the groundwater. Um, why it's called the other kind of garden? Um, the John Perrin guy lived in the Pyrenees um, and took care of a big um, wooden environment. And uh, that is in, in uh, France, uh, they had the heat of 40 degrees. He could not really have a little garden and he said, how can I do that? And he did it with his compost. So he only put um, a few wooden planks on the floor and uh, it's a very stony um, soil, which is in his environment. He had amazing results in uh, harvesting fruits and vegetables. And uh, he did it very simply. He didn't need to water it because the structure gave the water itself. And uh, for me, it's also called der Garten für Faule. So uh, that is a gardening for lazy people. Um, you literally can do it on every kind of ground, put it up, and after two years, you have a soil structure, which is amazing because all the capillars and all the uh, ground micro uh, microbiological environment is growing itself. Um, this is also Jean Pain um, by showing his uh, heat harvesting methodologies on the left hand side. Unfortunately, uh, you can't see the pipes really nicely, um, but it's the piping system which goes into a central heater by hydraulic, by water. And on the left hand side, he was heating a little hut um, with uh, air pipes. So he just put air pipes into the compost heap to harvest the heat out, out of there. Um, yeah, that's something you just can imagine that in the front you see a blue truck, in behind you see one of the big uh, compost heaps, and in the middle the white spot is one of the tanks which uh, produced methane gas, biogas. Uh, he had to dig it out because the compost heaps, the material around, the uh, methane gas uh, production part 
was still working, but the methane gas after three months um, was done because he had no filling and no um, releasing uh, uh, slurry material. So it was one tank set up with a slurry one time. And so he replaced it. And uh, what you may can imagine on the right hand side uh, amongst the white pillars um, are tubes from the truck, the truck tubes, the air tubes. And these are filled with biogas. So he used uh, the storage facility from truck tubes uh, to harvest his uh, methane gas. And what he did then is that he had a small compressor uh, and took the methane gas um, on the gas bottle on top of his Dijoux uh, two, the, the Ente, called in Germany, his old car. And he was running his car by biogas um, for a long time. And he was very self-dependent uh, with his energy. Over the time, um, we went into the experience how to build up the biomiler, the compost heap. And uh, one of the part was, how can we do it if we are not in a farming environment? So for that reason, we experimented also with uh, mesh bags, which you know from onions, potatoes, and wood. And uh, this is a carry device that you can bring also the um, dunk and the uh, wood chips in a small garden environment and build up a biomiler even in a smaller household um, where you don't have the opportunity to use um, any kind of uh, tractor. In this particular part, uh, we set up a biomiler for a sports environment. At the weekend, they had tournaments on soccer, so about all the groups playing there, 60 to 80 people needed a shower. So they had a 360 days um, usage of hot water. So that was a supply for the hot water system from uh, the sport club. In this particular case, we put up an uh, entire uh, compost heap by the mesh bags. So that was in a little garage where we put up a compost heap uh, for the house uh, central heating. So the smallest we built, or you can build, is about 40 cubic meters. So if you have a compost heap by 40 cubic meters, it is winter safe. If it's smaller, then the frost is going into it and brings down the temperature. And the biggest we ever built was about 200 cubic meters, which is quite a big piece. So all um, the biomiler, not supposed to be higher than 2 meter 50, 2 meter 50 is the best height for the biological and chemical process within. Um, it doesn't make it better if it's 3 meters high or 4 meters high. And the diameter of such a compost heap is about 8 meters. So that is one of the bigger forms and whatever is smaller is possible. So I have speed to speed up a bit, right? So otherwise, we are running out of, out of time. Um, here. Um, you can see a big tanker of, uh, I think it was 12,000 liters um, for watering, and the big pipe on, on top. Um, so water is one of the very, very important parts of the compost heap. So you need quite a bit of watering, or you need the slurry from um, the cows and pigs and horses. By the way, um, if you put up um, the compost heap with chicken dung, the temperature is in average 10 degrees higher than with any other manure. Um, I don't know, but the chemical um, situation from the chicken dung must be more energy carrying or the digestion process is much higher. And uh, if you only go for heat and you need heat about 70 degrees, um, then you go for chicken manure. Um, we have uh, a number of uh, biomiler built up in the southern part of uh, Denmark. Um, that is in the environment where Martin is working because last year in November we had a workshop in Flensburg where Martin participated and Christian participated. And um, they spread the word in Denmark and 
out of the sudden six of the biomiler came up and uh, two of them are with um, ecological uh, chicken uh, farm and they also have the um, purple wood or what, what is the name for that? Uh, Yeah, and they put uh, the biomiler up, and uh, one of them has 62 degrees standing heat. And when he puts on the big uh, heat exchanger for the chicken farm environment, which is really an industrial um, piece of equipment, he still has under full last and power 45 degrees for heating up his uh, chicken uh, stable. So that's a really, really good result. So um, there's one option uh, to go up uh, with a methane tank to put it in the middle. And uh, we have the gas supply on the top. We have a filling uh, pipe and we have uh, uh, the way out so that we have a processing methodology to make that happen. Um, the way it should look doesn't really matter whatever is round takes the most of the pressure because if you have the material set up and you water it or you put the slurry on it, it really gives a lot of weight. And in a round structure, it's the easiest way to um, work with the pressure. You also can put it amongst stone walls. There is no um, access to air needed. So it's an aerobic process on the top. What we really need is light from the top and air from the top, but any of the sides can be insulated, um, either by stone walls or by wood walls or whatever kind of uh, material you have available. So it's not necessary that the uh, sides are exposed to the air. Yeah, um, since the pictures are not uh, really that well to see, um, if you give me just a small email, um, I will send you the entire presentation. It now runs through the process how to set up a compost heap, which we are doing uh, later today at the um, bottom side of the uh, compound here. There is a workshop going on today how to set up a compost heap. And for that reason, I would like to give uh, over to Martin to talk about the microbiological carbonization. Thank you very much.